Okay, so let's go ahead and pick up where we left off. So this next section we're going to talk about voltaic cells, and this will pretty much finish off the electrochemistry chapter. Okay, so first off, let's talk about a couple definitions. So voltaic cell, also called a galvanic cell. This is like what you find in batteries. Okay, so a voltaic cell is a spontaneous redox chemical reaction that generates an electrical current. And we'll look at closer at these, but this is basically if you have a battery, you ha you're holding a voltaic cell. Okay, we also have what's called an electroly electrolytic cell. And in this type of cell, you need an electric current to drive a non-spontaneous reaction. So the big thing here is that a voltaic cell, okay, we have a spontaneous reaction. Whereas with an electrolytic cell, we have a non-spontaneous reaction. And an example of electrolytic cell would be like electroplating. Okay, so driving, for instance, zinc or copper or something like that onto a metal surface using an electrical current. That's an example of electrolytic cell. Okay, so the main thing we're going to talk about is voltaic cells. Okay, so let's look at just a basic system first. So here we have just a basic redox reaction, just like the ones we've been looking at. Okay, here we have zinc combining with copper to give us zinc 2 plus and copper solid. And then of course it's the solid zinc combining with aqueous copper to give us aqueous zinc and solid copper. So <clears throat> I think the best way to understand this is just to kind of have this idea, this experiment in your mind. Okay, so what we've done is we've taken a piece of zinc. Okay, so this is our zinc. Okay, and then this is our copper solution. So this is going to be copper 2. Not so important, okay, but it is copper 2. Okay, so we have a solution of copper 2 ions, and we have a solid piece of zinc. And let's break this reaction into two parts. So we have the oxidation half cell, just like when you were balancing reactions. You have your oxidation half cell, or your half reaction. You also have your reduction half reaction. So the oxidation part for zinc going from zinc solid to zinc 2 plus. Okay, so we have zinc solid going to zinc 2 plus and then it's giving off two electrons. Okay, it's oxidizing. So electrons are being lost by zinc. Our reduction half cell, we have copper 2 plus combining with those two electrons to give us copper solid. And to put that in terms of what's going on in our reaction here, so if we were to able to zoom in very closely to the surface of the zinc, this is what you would find. Okay, so we have copper ions in solution. Okay, so copper ions in solution. And then we have a zinc metal just on the surface. Okay, so notice how we have these nice just sort of lines of zinc atoms. Okay, so that's our metal surface. So what's going to happen here is that copper essentially is going to you can kind of think of it as taking two electrons from zinc or zinc giving up two electrons. Either way, and we'll talk about sort of more how you would decide that in a second. Um, but for now, just to know that, okay, zinc is giving up two electrons. Copper is taking those two electrons. And zinc is essentially being pulled into to solution. Okay, so where we only had copper ions in solution before, now we also have zinc ions. So we have copper ions, and now we're starting to get zinc ions. Okay, so the zinc metal, in other words, is being dissolved. Okay, so zinc is slowly being drug into the solution. Well, what's also happened simultaneously, and so you notice that we have sort of a darker blue solution here and more of a pristine metal surface and for our zinc. Maybe not quite pristine, but close. Maybe the reaction is just beginning. Okay, so if we look down at the bottom one, okay, notice now we have this dark surface and you can see that the zinc has sort of grown, right? So if you look, so this is, was our old surface of the zinc, and it's sort of hard to do because this is 3D. But you can see it's sort of now grown a shell around it. And you also notice that the copper solution is much lighter in color. Okay, so what's happening? Okay, so as the zinc is being pulled into solution, as it's dissolving, in other words, and giving up those two electrons, it's being oxidized, <clears throat> you're also combining, or now copper is gaining electrons, and it's turning into a solid. So what's happening? Okay, so we're actually starting to plate copper solid onto the surface of the zinc. Okay, and this will continue happening until either the, either the copper in solution is used up 
um, the zinc is used up or until this layer of copper metal surrounding the zinc, until that becomes too thick. There is a limit to this, you know, it's not just an infinite process. Okay, but it, eventually if you run out of copper, you run out of zinc, or that shell gets too big, it will stop. But this will continue on until it happens. Okay, so this is happening at the surface. So you notice what's missing. So we're not exactly harnessing these electrons. So they're just going from zinc to the copper, and there's nothing in the middle to sort of capture them. Okay, so there's just a redox reaction occurring and nothing else. Okay, so the question is, how can we how can we harness the transfer of electrons? How can we make them do something to our advantage? So I told you, this is the type of thing that's involved in batteries. Okay, well, how are we using this to our advantage? So the way we can put this and give it or make it advantageous to us, so the way we can take advantage of it, is we can connect some wires between, so we have called this the anode and the cathode. Okay, so we can connect wires between two plates and then we have two solutions. Okay, but the important thing is here, we're giving essentially a path for electrons to flow. Okay, and if we put some device in the middle of that, could be a light bulb, could be anything. Okay, if we put something in the middle of that, then we can use that flow of electrons to generate power, okay, or to, we can use it to power something. Okay, so let's take a look at what's happening here. Okay, so this is your basic voltaic cell. So we have the same reaction. So zinc being oxidized, copper being reduced, the exact same reaction. The only difference is now we have something in the middle. Okay, so let's take a look at our voltaic cell. So this is a voltaic cell. The parts that make it up, okay, first we'll start from the anode, just for fun. Okay, so on our left-hand side, we have our zinc plate. So this is our zinc metal still. Okay, and this is going to be called the anode. Okay, and then our right hand side, we have a copper plate. This will be called our cathode. Okay, and so what's interesting here is at the anode, okay, this is where we have our oxidation occurring. The cathode, this is where we have our reduction occurring. A good way to remember those is you can say red. say red cat okay so what that means is that reduction occurs at the cathode um, so you can even write this full expression out Leo the red cat says Gur okay so that's put that puts Leo Gur and red cat all into one sentence if that helps you remember it um, I typically remember them separately but nothing wrong with putting them together okay so reduction is occurring at the cathode, oxidation is occurring at the anode. Okay, so how is this possible? Okay, so we just have two pieces of metal connected with a wire at this point. So also in solution, or also in each beaker, we have two solutions. So here we have zinc nitrate, and here we have copper nitrate. Okay, and the reason we have that is that we need something to still be transferring electrons. We still need metal sources. Okay, so we still need sources of copper, we still need the courses of sources of zinc. Okay, so that's where that comes from. And then connecting the two, we have in the middle, we have what's called the salt bridge. Okay, and this can be any salt. Here they're using potassium nitrate. Doesn't really matter. The whole purpose of the salt bridge is to help balance it electronically. Okay, so we have something that can give off positive ions, something that can give off negative ions. If you don't have this salt bridge, nothing will occur. Okay, so if you disconnect these, nothing's going to happen. You have to have some way of balancing the, the electrons, and it has to be connected in this way. Okay, so what we have on our anode side, we have electrons coming off of zinc. Okay, so zinc is giving up two electrons, and zinc 2 plus is flowing into solution. Okay, so everywhere on the zinc that's inside the solution, you have zinc 2 plus coming off and you have electrons flowing up. Okay, so electrons flowing through the wire. Okay, then our cathode side, those same electrons come down, okay, and now they're basically stuck on the metal, on the piece of metal. Okay, and now copper from solution 
is now attaching to the metal surface. In other words, it's being reduced. Okay, so copper is sticking to the copper metal. Okay, so it's becoming copper zero. So it's going from copper to in solution, and it's plating onto the copper solid. Okay, so basically over time, you can kind of envision this, over time your zinc plate would eventually completely dissolve, and your copper plate would grow if you would just let this go forever. Okay, there's a, again, there is a limit to these, but that's kind of the way you can think of it. Okay, so that's your basic voltaic cell. And then if you are to put something like a light bulb in between, since we have electron flow, obviously electrons are going to flow through the light bulb, through our filament, okay, and back down, and just continue on. Of course, then we have a resistor there, so, well, that's kind of another conversation. Okay, but that's what's happening. Okay, so let's break down the anode a little bit. So the anode is the place where oxidation occurs, electrodes where electrons are produced. So this is where electrons are produced for the voltaic cell. In other words, it's being oxidized, so it's giving off electrons. Anions migrate toward the anode, and it generally has a negative sign, okay, depending on where you are. So the only thing I didn't mention is that with from the Salt bridge here, notice you have negative ions moving towards this side, and you have positive ions moving towards this side. Okay, so that's just coming from the salt bridge to uh, balance out the positive charge. So your this beaker is gradually becoming more positive, this beaker is gradually becoming more negative, so you need anion you need ions to balance that out. Okay, so your anode will have the negative sign, it's your negative terminal. Okay, then we have your cathode. So the cathode is where reduction occurs. Remember, red cat, reduction occurs at the cathode. Okay, the electrode where electrons are consumed. Okay, it's being reduced, so it's consuming electrons. Cations migrate towards the cathode, and it has a positive sign. Okay, so we can break down our voltaic cell into our anode and our cathode half reaction. This is what you generally do when you're trying to study these. Okay, so our anode, remember, this is where our, uh, our oxidation is occurring. Okay, so we have zinc metal giving us zinc 2 plus and 2 electrons. Okay, and at the cathode, we have copper consuming those electrons, giving us copper solid. So our overall reaction here, zinc solid, plus copper 2 plus, giving us zinc 2 plus and copper solid. Okay, so in just that's exactly what we saw before. We have this exchange of electrons. We're essentially electroplating copper, and we're pulling zinc into solution. So this is our two anode and our cathode reactions add up, so our half reactions add up to our complete reaction. Okay, so this is um, an important kind of slide here in that it shows you the shorthand. Okay, so this is a way of writing voltaic cells without having to write out the complete anode, the complete cathode, and the whole reaction. It's just a shorthand. Okay, so the way that you do this is that you write out the anode on the left-hand side, and you write the cathode out on the right-hand side. Sorry, anode on the left, cathode on the right. Okay, so the way that this reads is that we have zinc metal being oxidized to give us zinc 2 plus. This line in the middle represents us a, a barrier, so a phase barrier. Meaning that it's transitioning from a solid to aqueous. So this would be a represent the difference between the stick of metal and the solution. Okay, on the right hand side, we have is copper 2 plus aqueous giving us copper metal. Okay, so again, this is our phase barrier. Okay, and then these two lines in between, this is essentially, you could see a picture like the wire connecting them, something like that. In other words, that's the barrier between the two cells. Okay, so you could write two individual cells from this. Okay, so that's our shorthand. Um, and your lab is going to ask you about how to write in shorthand. And this is how you do it. Okay, so anytime you see this, it's always going to be anode on the left cathode on the right. Okay, 
Okay, so this is just sort of an abbreviated way of writing this. Okay, just remember, anode on the left, cathode on the right. And then remember that your charged ions always go towards the middle. Okay, and then all you have to remember past that is to put lines in between the phase barriers and to put two lines in between the individual cells. Okay, yeah, oh, um, one thing I should also mention is this uh, also represents the salt bridge. Okay, so you can envision it that way as well. So double line can also represent the salt bridge. I guess that is what it represents. Okay, but it also a way to think of it as sort of dividing the cells. Okay, but also it represents the salt bridge. And your electron flow will always be from your anode to your cathode, just as it was. Okay, so that's everything labeled for you there. Okay, so let's move on, and we're going to start putting um, some math to this, I believe. Yeah, so we're going to start talking about cell potentials. So it's all well and good to understand how this is working, but now let's talk about uh, what we can actually gain from it. Okay, so we can say that water spontaneously flows only in one way from a waterfall, right? Of course, water only flows with gravity downward, okay, to the Earth. Okay, so in other words, it's going from high potential to low potential. Okay, so remember MGH. Okay, so we're going from high potential at the top of the waterfall to low potential at the bottom. Okay, well similarly, this is the way electrons flow. So electrons spontaneously flow only from high to low potential. Okay, so if I have the anode, the cathode, if the potential is lower at the cathode than at the anode, okay, I will have electron flow. And if I put something in between it, and it will light like a light bulb, it will light up. Okay, so this is known as electromotive force, or EMF. So it's the driving force or electrical potential that pushes the negatively charged electrons away from the anode and pulls them toward the cathode. Okay, so the EMF is represented by, by the cell potential. We write this as E cell, or voltaic cell, also called the cell voltage. Okay, so E cell or cell voltage, or you can also say cell potential. Those are all saying the same thing, but generally you're going to see it written as E cell. Okay, so if we're interested in knowing how much power we can put or how much energy we can put out of a, uh, a battery or something like this or a, a voltaic cell, we're going to calculate E cell or we're going to look at E cell. Okay, so for voltaic cells where electrons are spontaneously flowing from the anode to the cathode, E cell must be greater than zero. Not greater than equal to, but greater than zero. Okay, if the cell is operating under standard state conditions, so one molar solutions, one atmosphere and a ga for gases, and 25 degrees C, then E cell is defined as E naught cell. So just the same as we were talking about H naught and S naught, so just at standard conditions, we have E naught cell. And cell potential is measured in volts. And just, and, uh, just to remember that one volt is equal to one joule per coulomb where volts, of course, is the SI unit for electric potential. Joules are the SI unit for energy, and coulombs uh, represents electrical charge. So one coulomb is the amount of charge transferred when a current of one amp flows for one second. Okay, so it's kind of a derived unit there. Guess what? When I talk about in terms of volts, but just remember we can transfer, we can uh, convert volts to joules per coulomb if we need to. And we will do that from time to time when we start talking about comparing this to delta G or something like that. Okay, so we have our same voltaic cell here. Okay, and notice this time they've gone ahead and filled in our, our molarities here. So they're both at one molarity. That means that this is at uh, standard conditions. Okay, so at standard conditions, the reading from the voltmeter, okay, this is what you would be doing in a lab if we were having it. Okay, so you would just hook up a voltmeter. Okay, and the voltmeter will tell you E cell. Okay, and since we're at standard conditions, this represents E naught cell. Okay, so E cell for this particular voltaic cell will be plus 
1.1 volts. Okay, notice that's greater than 1, or greater than 0, I should say. Just as long as we're on this uh, slide here, a good thing to point out here is that if I was to reverse these poles, this would become a negative sign. Okay, so this would become minus 1.1 volts. So if you ever see that, just know you've probably got your anode and your cathode hooked up backwards, or just your little alligator clips hooked up backwards. Okay, so what if we want to do some calculations with this? What, what are we going to do? Okay, so one thing we can use this for is that if we want to calculate free energy, okay, so remember delta G is our free energy change, we can calculate this using this equation. So when you say delta G is equal to minus N, where N is the number of moles, times this like little kind of cursive F, which is the Faraday. So this is Faraday's constant. Faraday's constant is equal to 96,500 coulombs per mole of electrons, or 96,500 joules per volts times moles of electrons. And then E cell will be what you measure from your voltmeter, okay, or what's given to you from tables. Okay, so this is how we would calculate delta G given cell potential. Okay, so if we can measure delta, if we can measure E cell, then from that, and we know the equation that we're working with, so we know what reaction we're dealing with, then from that we can calculate delta G. Okay, so suppose we had this information, so practice problem here. Okay, so the standard cell potential is 25 degrees C. At 25 degrees C is 1.1 volt for the reaction. This is the one we've been looking at. Okay, so zinc reacting with copper to give us zinc 2 plus and copper solid. Okay, so they want us to calculate the standard free energy, the delta G, for this reaction at 25 degrees C. Okay, so we know we're at 25 degrees C. Okay, and they're telling us that this is um, standard cell potential. So we know we're at standard conditions. Okay, so we can use our delta G equation. So delta G naught will be equal to minus N times the Faraday times E naught. Okay, so first thing is you have to figure out how many moles of electrons are being transferred. Well, when you're dealing with a reaction like this where it's pretty cut and dry, so going from zero to two plus, two plus to zero, okay, you can kind of tell that there's two electrons being transferred, right? In other words, two moles of electrons being transferred. Okay, so it's not always that easy to tell. But for this one, it's pretty simple. Okay, so we're transferring two electrons. Remember that reaction equations also represent moles. Okay, so we can say two moles of electrons times the Faraday times E cell. And this is in volts. Okay, and then we're just going to say, well, I know volts are also equal to joules uh, per coulomb. Okay, and I'm just going to uh, convert that to joules as well the kilojoules at the end. Okay, just put make delta G make sense. We're going to put it in terms of joules and kilojoules. Okay, so if we go back, remember that. Well, I can't go back quite that far. Okay, remember that. Let's just draw. Oh, here we go. Not too far back. So remember that one volt is equal to one joule over one coulomb. Okay, so here you have one volt equal to one joule over one coulomb. Okay, and that's going to cancel out our volts. And we're just going to convert that to joules, or I mean to kilojoules at the end. Okay, so if we plug all our numbers in, we end up with minus 212 kilojoules per mole. Or not per mole, excuse me, just 212 kilojoules. So that's our delta G here. Okay, if you remember delta G less than zero for a spontaneous reaction. Okay, so this would be a spontaneous reaction. Okay, so here's one for you to try. Okay, this one to try, and then we will work it out together. So here they're asking us to check the standard free energy change for the following reaction, and we're at standard conditions, and they gave us E cell. Okay, so try to use Faraday equation to calculate delta G. So 
let's put the snot together. Okay, so we've just been asked to calculate delta G, and they've given us E cell. So right away, that should tell you that you need to use this equation. Okay, so we're going to use delta G naught is equal to minus N times the Faraday times E dot cell. Okay, so all we have to do here is say delta G is equal to, first thing we have to figure out is the number of moles of electrons. Okay, so easiest thing to do here is to spot this change. So gold's going from gold zero to gold three. Okay, and we have two gold on each side. So that means in total, in total, we have six moles of electrons. Okay, times our Faraday. then times E cell. Okay, then just to make our answer in the right units, we can say also multiply by one joule over coulomb times volts, and then convert our joules to kilojoules. So one kilojoule over a thousand joules. Okay, so that'll give us our answer in kilojoules. So if you do this math, you end up with 2.53 times 10 to the third kilojoules. So we're left with units of kilojoules. Okay, so this would be your final answer. Okay, so here we have delta G greater than zero. They said this would be non-spontaneous, but they didn't ask us that. Okay, so in this next section, we'll talk about standard reduction potentials and sort of how do we put these on a scale? So similarly to something like temperature, how do we put these on a scale that we can compare? Okay, so the way that we do this, so we have what's called standard reduction potential. Okay, and we have to have a standard just like any other reaction or any other measurement, we need a standard. Okay, and this particular standard we use is called standard hydrogen electrode, SHE. Okay, and there are other standards as well. Okay, but this is a very common one that's used. Okay, so you'll compare voltage against SHE. Okay, so this is our reference electrode. And essentially, this is just oxidation and reduction of, of hydrogen. Okay, so you have H2 gas. Essentially, you have that oxidation reduction reaction happening, and you compare that to something like, I don't know, copper, and you read the voltage, and then you can compare those to other voltages. So as long as we know what our standard is, essentially, we set this equal to zero. We'll see that in a second. Okay, but that gives us a way to compare between voltages. Okay, so specifically, so the standard hydrogen electrode has been chosen as a reference electrode. And we're going to see that its half cell has to be defined as zero volts. Okay, so this is our zero number. This is how we, this would be like zero Celsius, you know, freezing point of water. This is how we've defined it. Okay, so the, at the, when SHE is the anode oxidation, so E oxidation is equal to zero. And if it's a cathode, a E of reduction is equal to zero volts. Okay, so it's just our zero point, nothing more than that. Okay, and oftentimes this is used in a reaction as well. Um, you'll insert also a reference electrode to kind of make it easier on you when you're like processing all the data. Okay, but for us, just understand this is where we, how we built the scale. Okay, so let's look at an anode and a cathode. So we have two half reactions here. Okay, so this is for the voltaic cell we just looked at here. Okay, so if our anode half reaction is for hydrogen, okay, so we have hydrogen gas giving us 2H plus plus two electrons being oxidized. 
and then we have copper being reduced. Okay, so of course, remember, reduction occurs with the cathode. So our overall cell is H2 plus copper 2 plus gives us 2H plus and copper. Okay, so suppose we wanted to calculate E cell for this reaction. Well, what we could do is we could we can connect a voltmeter, and if we know that our oxidation potential is zero, well, suppose we wanted to know what our reduction potential was. Okay, well, then we could set up this equation. So E cell is equal to E ox plus E reduction. Okay, and we know this from our voltmeter. So we, so we can say that three, our E cell, so E cell, again, is just what you're measuring between the two different voltaic cells. Okay, so E cell is equal to 0 0.34 volts, which is equal to 0 volts plus E red. And again, 0 volts because this is our standard. Okay, so what this gives us the power to do is to calculate E of reduction, so the reduction potential for copper, okay, versus SHE. Okay, so copper two gaining two electrons, okay, has a reduction potential of positive 0 0.34 volts because we're comparing it to something we know. We could also compare it to something else we know, where this, in this particular way, since we're comparing it to zero, it makes our life easy. Okay, so here we have a similar setup. So we have our SHE, this time versus zinc. Okay, and our voltmeter reads 0 0.76 volts. Okay, so we can break this down the same way. And again, if we set up our E cell equation, so E cell, what you measure, is equal to E ox plus E reduction, so E of oxidation plus E of reduction. Okay, we read 0 0.76 volts. This tells us this time, so notice this time our anode is where zinc is, and our cathode is where hydrogen is. So uh, hydrogen is being reduced. So you put zero to E reduction. Okay, so this time, the 0 0.76 tells us the E of oxidation. Okay, so it's important to know at all times, you know, when you're building these cells or when you're calculating for these cells, which one is the anode and which one is the cathode, because it would change everything. It could change everything. Okay, so we would be calculating or we would, we would, if we didn't know that, for instance, the cathode was hydrogen this time, we would think that we were calculating a reduction potential, but we're not. We're calculating oxidation potential. Okay, so the point I'm trying to make is just make sure you know which one is the anthode, anode and which one is the cathode, and make sure you know what's going on between those two. Okay, so a good point here is that if we want to change from an oxidation potential to a reduction potential, and this is where you're going to see most often. You're going to see reduction potentials. Not so often are you going to see oxidation potentials. Okay, what you do, you flip the sign. So notice this was positive, this becomes negative. So if you transfer between reduction to oxidation or vice versa, you're just going to flip the sign. Why are we doing that? Because essentially you're reversing the equation. Okay, so if we want to talk about reduction, we would point the arrow this way. Okay, but in the way it's drawn, it's oxidation. So if you flip that around, it becomes reduction. Therefore, you flip the sign of the potential. Okay, so this is a chart of reduction potentials. Okay, and what you see is the half reaction, okay, followed by the reduction potential. Okay, and what you see is that things at the top are stronger oxidizing agents. Which remember means if they're oxidizing agent, it means they're being reduced. Things at the bottom are stronger reducing agents. That means they're more likely to be oxidized. So what you can do with a chart like this is that the cathode, one thing that it tells you, will always be towards the top. Okay, and your cath your anode, I'm trying to write down here. There we go. Your anode will always be at the bottom. Why? Because things at the top are more likely to be reduced than things at the bottom. Okay, so if you're ever trying to decide which is my anode or which is my cathode, this is one way you can tell, if you know all these things. Otherwise, you would know because, oh, I put the red wire here and the black wire there. Okay, so that's how you would know in that case. Okay, but notice our SHE right here in the middle. Okay, then you have things more likely to be reduced at the top, more things more likely to be oxidized at the bottom. Okay, so your cathodes will come from the top, your anodes will come from the bottom. Okay, so the anode, where oxidation occurs, has the most oxidative potential 
but it has the least amount of reductive potential. So coming back, so notice that these values are small. Okay, so your anode has the least amount of reductive potential. Cathode has the most, where, you know, this is where reduction occurs, has the most reductive potential. Okay, so it has the highest reduction potential, but it also has the least oxidative potential. Okay, therefore the anode will always be below the cathode on the table of standard reduction potentials. So just what I told you, the anode will always be below the cathode. Okay, so things with higher reduction potential, those will tend to be your cathodes. Things with lower, so negative, doesn't have to be negative, it just has to be lower, will tend to be your anodes. Okay, so we can calculate standard self potential. So if we know the reduction potential for the anode and the cathode, and this is something you'll be using in your lab. Okay, so if we know the standard potentials for each, the, the cathode and the anode, okay, so we're looking at reduction potentials, then we can calculate what E cell should be, or if we know E cell, then we can calculate reduction potential for the anode or the cathode. And here it's important to know that E cell will be greater than zero for a spontaneous reaction, and E cell will be less than zero for a non-spontaneous reaction. Okay, so if you're asked to, for instance, calculate cell potential, and tell whether it's spontaneous, this is how you know. Okay, if it's greater than zero, it's spontaneous. If it's less than zero, it's not spontaneous. Okay, so let's take a look at a cell. Okay, so all the way back to our zinc copper cell. Okay, so for the anode, we have a reduction potential of minus 0 0.76. For the cathode, we have a reduction potential of positive 0 0.34. Okay, so remember the cathode will always have a higher reduction potential than the anode. Okay, and then we measure E cell here, 1.10 volts. Okay, so suppose we wanted to calculate E cell for this. So E cell would be equal to, so cathode, so this is the cathode, minus, so notice this is a minus sign, minus the, the reduction potential for the anode. So notice these are both reduction potentials. Okay, you're almost always gonna talk in terms of reduction potential. Okay, so reduction potential of the cathode minus reduction potential of the anode, okay? So 0 0.34 minus a minus 7.6, which gives you a positive 1.10 volts. Okay, and if one of these was unknown, so for instance, if we wanted to know, okay, what would be the, the E cell? We could calculate this way. Or suppose we didn't know what the reduction potential was for the cathode or for the anode. Let's say we didn't know what it was for the anode. So we didn't know this. Okay, we could still calculate it based on this equation. Okay, so here they're making a note that this is an intensitive property, meaning that change in concentration doesn't do anything. So doubling, oh, excuse me, so doubling the reaction, for instance, doesn't change the cell potential. So Unlike when we were dealing with um, some other equations, when you were to double it, you would change the constants. Here, if you double it, it doesn't change anything. So making it twice as concentrated, for instance, doesn't do anything. Okay. So, but reversing it does change the sign, but multiplying it doesn't do anything. Okay, so here's a problem for us to try. So it says a new battery system currently under study for possible use in electric vehicles is a zinc chloride battery. The net reaction producing electricity in this voltaic cell is zinc plus chlorine gives us zinc chloride. They want us to calculate E cell of this cell, and they want us to refer to this index for the standard reduction potential. So you're going to use your E cell equation to calculate the cell potential. Okay, give this one a try real quick. These should be pretty easy, um, and then I'll go over it with you. So let's take a look at this. So first thing, set up your E cell, your e -cell equation. Okay, then we need to identify what's the cathode and what's the anode. Okay, so here we have zinc going from zinc zero to zinc two plus, chlorine going from zinc or chloride zero to chloride minus one. Okay, so in other words, we have zinc being oxidized. Okay, so zinc is being oxidized, chlorine, being reduced. Okay, so what happens at the cathode? 
So the cathode, reduction happens at the cathode. Oh, why am I handling this so funny this thing? There we go. So cathode will be the chloride, okay, and this will be the anode, since it's not being oxidized. Okay, so now what we have to do is we have to go back and we need to get reduction potentials for each of these. Okay, so let's go back and look at our table. Okay, so we need zinc and we need chlorine. Okay, so here's zinc. Okay, then we need chlorine as well. Okay, notice these are already in reduction potential, so no one need to switch the sign or anything, flip the sign or anything like that. So come over, so reduction potential for chlorine, 1.36 volts, and for zinc, 0.76 volts. Okay, and what did we say? We said uh, chlorine was our cathode. Okay, so it's high on the scale, so that works out. Okay, so now all I have to do is plug those numbers in. Okay, so for our cathode, we said that for chlorine, it was 1.36. And for our anode, we said that it was 0 0.76, minus 0 0.76. Okay, so just plug these numbers in. Okay, so 1.36 volts minus a negative 0 0.76 volts. Okay, so you end up with a total of 2.12 volts. Okay, and this is your B naught cell. Okay, that would be your final answer. So going back to the slides, a couple more problems here. Um, I'm going to let you do these on your own, and if you do have problems with them, please do let me know. Um, but I feel like you guys can handle these now that you've seen it done um, once, so really no big deal here. The only thing, just remember your shorthand. Okay, so just remember that this means that cadmium is going from 0 to 2 plus. In other words, it's being oxidized, so this is the anode. And this is the cathode. Okay, so give these a try. Give this one a try. I feel like you can handle it just fine. Um, and then this one. So here they want to know which one is spontaneous or not. So what they're asking you here, they're asking you to calculate E cell. And basically they want you to know to tell whether it's greater than zero or if E cell is less than zero. So this would be spontaneous and then less than zero would not be spontaneous. So I think you can handle those. Um, if you do run into any trouble, please feel free to let me know. Okay, and the very last thing I want to cover here is just what to do if, what if we're not at standard conditions? So we're not always going to be at standard conditions. Maybe, you know, maybe it's getting hot or maybe it's under pressure or what if it's not under standard conditions? Okay, so for that, we come into the nurse's equation. Okay, so if we start out from just our delta G equation, so remember that delta G, just on its own, is equal to delta G naught plus RT times the natural log of Q, where Q is, remember, just comparing to our equilibrium constant, but it just means we're not at equilibrium, or possibly not at equilibrium. And now we've compared delta G using the Faraday to our E cell. Okay, so we can combine those two, and we end up with it's known as the Nernst equation. So this tells us that E cell, and notice this means we're not at standard conditions, is equal to E cell at standard conditions minus RT over the number of moles times the Faraday times the ln of Q. Okay, so this is our Nernst equation. So if you're not at standard conditions and you want to calculate E cell, this is how you would do it. So first you have to calculate, or you have to either know or calculate 
E sell it, standard conditions. And then you can plug in R, which is your gas constant, T, your temperature, and the number of moles, your Faraday, and then you have to calculate Q, just like you would have calculated Q before. Okay, or you can put this in terms of base 10 log, where you add this little constant in front, so 2.303, everything else stays the same. Okay, and we can substitute out, and we can get what's known as the working version of the Nernst equation, okay, which is E cells equal to E naught cell minus 0 0.0592 volts times moles over N times the log of Q. Okay, so if you're asked to calculate E cell at non-standard conditions, that's how you're going to do it. Okay, and you can look to the slides for uh, some guided examples there. Uh, but this will finish up the electrochemistry chapter. So this will finish up everything you need to know for the last exam, your exam three. Um, please feel free to let me know if you have any questions. Um, good luck.